No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. These are the ways the world will land. These are the ways the world will land. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will land. I said, these are the ways the world will land. These are the ways the world will land. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will land. Odds of dying by asteroid impact, one in 700,000. The overall risk of dying from an impact in your lifetime is one in 700,000, somewhat less than being killed by a fireworks accident, but still more probable than being killed on an amusement park ride or by an act of terrorism. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will end. Odds of dying by supernova explosion, one in 10 million. Supernovae happen about once per century, and I'm glad you like that too, in any given galaxy. Assuming the event could cause a mass extinction killing everyone on Earth, the odds of you specifically dying from one during your lifetime are about one in 10 million. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will end. Odds of dying by solar flare or coronal mass ejection. Zero, but with an asterisk. While a whopping big solar event can seriously impair or destroy a nation's infrastructure and economy, in general, it would not directly cause deaths. We have to rate this as zero chance for human fatality, but with an asterisk, as a nod to the destructive power it has in other ways. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will end. Odds of dying by gamma ray burst. One in 14 million. Gamma ray bursts are dangerous from distances of more than 7,000 light years. You would have to be in the path of a relatively narrow beam to get hurt. Your odds of being killed by a GRB are then 1 in 14 million. You're about as likely to be killed by a shark attack. These are the ways the world will land. 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 Eventual odds of dying by death of the sun. Inevitable. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways. These are the ways the world will end. Eventual odds of dying by galactic doom. Inevitable. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. Eventual odds of dying by death of the universe. Inevitable. These are Correct. the ways the world will end. These are the ways the world will end. These are the ways, these are the ways, these are the ways the world will end. George Robb, everybody. Thank you for coming to These Are the Ways the World Will End and give them one more round of applause. Phil Flight and George Rapp. I'd like to take some time to introduce our panelists just one moment and give them time to take a sentence to explain who they are and what they are doing here on this panel. Right here we have Phil Plate. Hi. I wrote the book on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> and right here we have Dr. Ali Khan. Good morning. I keep, I keep America safe from public health threats. Uh, I've gotten some nice comments on this costume. Actually, I am. It's a, very authentic. I'm, a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm an assistant surgeon general with the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, and uh, I'm at CDC. Down in the end, we have Taylor Proctor. Hi, uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, I, uh, not really on a global scale. I work for the state of Georgia, and I keep uh, water drinkers in Georgia safe from contaminated groundwater. Yeah. So is this a sign of the robot uprising, what we're having right here with the technical <laughs> dude? 
I am a physician. Sadly, I did not bring my own costume, which is sad. Uh, Baltimore area infectious diseases specialist. I also work with Johns Hopkins in training residents and medical students and do things with evidence-based medicine, which is nice because I can talk about the weaknesses of evidence-based medicine and teach them about science-based medicine. Yay. In the middle, we have Dr. Pamela Gay. Yay. Hi, I work at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and I have a nonprofit called Astrosphere New Media that has a table lost in the Sheraton that you all need to go visit. Um, I work with a number of different planetary exploration missions where we're trying to study how, in the past, asteroids pulverized the surfaces of planets. On my far right, we have author Scott Sigler, Hello. also known as the Dark Overlord. Uh, I am a fiction author. I've written books, Infected, Contagious, Ancestor, and Not Colonel, which will be out April 3rd. Uh, I give away all my stories as free serialized podcasts at scottsigler.com, and I spend a lot of time thinking of ways to foil people like this and actually kill you all. <laughs> Okay, we're doing this panel a little unusual some, from other panels. There's a four minute timer on each topic. And what we're doing is we're not taking questions during this four minute timer. And we're gonna go through a list of about seven topics. And at the end of these topics, we will take questions and answers at the end. So this is gonna be a, a quick run through each one of these topics. You'll get to hear the experts up here talk about these topics. And then we're gonna cut them off at the end of four minutes. Ha <laughs> ha, we think. And, uh, at the end of that time, we'll take all your questions and answers on these topics or whatever you would like to discuss on ways you think the world might end or might not. And the first topic we'll go with is solar flares, coronal mass injection. Ready? Go. I got you got nothing. <laughs> So this is actually a concern because our sun doesn't warn us before it does nasty things. But because light travels faster than the stuff that will kill you, we will see coming death. And if you go to the bottom of a mine or something like that, like if it's really bad, this probably won't happen. Sun currently quiet, not giving off x-ray flares. Everyone will be fine. But while we don't really have to worry with the sun and its current behaving status of evolution, um, we do have to worry about our power grid. Solar mass ejection heads our way. Amazing, beautiful auroras in the sky. You can see them all the way down to like Florida. If it's really big, can see them everywhere. That's bad. Um, but when all of this stuff hits the Earth's magnetic field, it makes the magnetic field vibrate. And vibrated magnetic fields get very happy and produce electricity in nearby wires, including like the power grid add electricity to the power grid, it doesn't like it and it blows the world's power grid fuse. That's not death, but it's lack of internet, which is another form of death. <laughs> Very good, and, anybody else? And in fact, this happened in 1989 in Quebec in March. A solar flare actually blew out a power grid in, in uh, North America and a lot of people were without power for three days in Quebec in March. So it's not a good thing to have this happen. You can kind of think of our power grid as being like a series of pipes. I was going to say tubes, but I wouldn't do that. With water flowing through them, and if you try to ram more water through them than they can handle, they burst. And that's kind of what happens. The sun is basically, through a series of steps, injecting more electricity into our power grid, and that blows it out. So this is one of the very few disasters that can be 100% prevented simply by making a bigger power grid. If we had twice as many wires, we'd have, be able to handle twice as much flow. Although you need insulators and other things as well uh, along the way. But this is something we can, we cannot prevent, but we can mitigate and make sure it doesn't hurt our power grid. We, we uh, fix our satellites so that they're not affected by this as much as they could be. You just stick a satellite out there, if it get, hit, gets hit by these particles, it's gone. Yeah. So they, they can harden them against this kind of radiation. So this is one of the very few things, like I said, that we can gird our loins against. And, and I would actually suggest that we do this. But our government isn't right now, so I'm a little concerned about the upcoming solar maximum. It's not like it's going to kill anybody, but it, it could cause uh, widespread power outages and other problems. And if you want to help protect the planet Earth, you actually can with this one. There's two satellites, stereo A and B, because astronomers can't name things, that 
if you are all the wall of sunlight coming towards the planet Earth, there's one satellite ahead of the planet Earth in its orbit, another behind the planet Earth in its orbit, looking at the space between the sun and the planet Earth. And because there's two of them, we can see the trajectory of oncoming mass ejections. But the problem is NASA doesn't have enough people to look at the oncoming images, so we've put them all online at a website called Solar Storm Watch that lets you help be part of the Earth weather forecasting. Call it Solar Death Watch. Oh, well, uh, yeah, Solar Death Watch would have been better, but it's an educational site that we allow small children to use. They love that so, so, the well, sooner the, they learn, the better. So, <laughs> I, I will never forget Dragon Con three or four years ago, Phil talking about asteroids hitting the Earth and showing the artist rendering, and a small child bursting into tears in the back of the room, thinking it was real. It, thank you for reminding me of that too. That was a, <laughs> that was an awesome moment in my life. Actually. It was a life lesson for all of yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our timer is turning up. It is up, and we're going to the next topic. You know, it's a little disconcerting seeing that thing ticking down the last few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> end. Yeah, end. <laughs> Said end. Okay. okay, the next topic we've got on is gamma ray burst. Okay, anybody want to start with this one? Well, I spent five years studying them, so why not? Um, this is, this is um, uh, there are a lot of different ways of making them, but they are essentially gigantic explosions when stars die. And, and one of them is caused by a very supermassive star that blows up as a, as a supernova, but in the core of the star, the, the core collapses down. The, the outer parts blow outward. The inner parts collapse down and form a black hole. And all kinds of things happen that are very complicated and take way more than three minutes and 28 seconds to describe. And so you get, a, you get a disk of material that swirls around the black hole and that focuses twin beams of matter and energy that shoot out of this thing at approximately the speed of light. The amount of energy in these beams is beyond comprehension. It's as if you took the entire sun's lifetime output of energy over 11 billion years lifetime of the sun and compress it down into a beam that is basically going to last a few seconds. And so anything in the path of this beam is going to get vaporized for a ways. As the beam goes, it spreads out. And as, that, as it moves across the galaxy, the energy in the beam gets spread out so that it's not as uh, uh, deadly. So it turns out that if one is about seven or 8,000 light years away, the number's a little squishy. But it's that kind of distance. It's far enough away that it doesn't hurt us. The good news is we don't think there are any stars that close to the Earth that can do this. The bad news is there are two that are right sort of kind of on the edge of that. The good news is they might not be pointed at us. The bad news is they might be. Um, um, we actually, and, and in fact, uh, we don't think that the stars that can do this form in the current universe. The, we, we see these things really, really, really far away where they can't hurt us. And we think the conditions in the universe back then were different and could form these things better. Um, there's not much to say about this, except I did the calculations years ago where if I said, what if one of these things were 100 light years from the Earth instead of you know, 100 billion or, or 100 million, what would happen? And it turns out it would be like blowing up tens of millions of nuclear weapons all over the side of the Earth facing the gamma ray burst. So that would, that would be bad. Um, <laughs> there's not much you can, you can do about that, actually. Can, can, can you stop, drop, and roll? Will that fix it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Stop, drop, and be nucle nu nucleated down to your subatomic Just particles. duck and cover. Yeah. So. Oh, duck and bad. vaporize, I believe, is the term now. So, oh. so <laughs> one, one of the fascinating things about these things is it makes you remember the sun is moving. Because while there's none nearby now, every 135 million years, we go all the way around this Milky Way galaxy that we live in, get new neighbors along the way, and some of them might be less well-behaved. So while we do believe there probably aren't any stars forming in the modern universe, we've been proven wrong on things like this before. So it could be 70 million years from now, another part of the galaxy, boom, we're dead. I'll, I'll add that there's circumstantial evidence that the, the trilobites in the Ordovician extinction, did I get that right? Yeah. Um, may have been wiped out by a gamma ray burst. It's not con conclusive at all, it's interesting. And also there is, there's concrete evidence that a nearby supernova blew up near the Earth about two to three million years ago. 
there's the presence of um, a radioactive uh, isotope of iron in the bottom of the ocean that's been picked up in sediments that's much higher than normal. And this, I this isotope, iron-60, is only created in supernova explosions. And there had to have been one nearby to get that to the Earth before it decayed away. So two, three million years ago, there was probably something in the sky that blew up, and it was very close, probably um, certainly within 100 light years. So it's pretty amazing. So in case you missed it, that means it rained stardust. And that stardust is on the bottom of the ocean right now. Not a lot, but enough. But still, to it rained yeah, stardust. Yeah. Cool. And the street value of that stuff is through the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I just want to put it on eBay. Okay, our time's up for this topic, and I'm going to skip to the... Uh, down two topics, and I'm going to move this one up. Asteroid impact. We're still doing astronomy. <laughs> yes, yes. We're going to go to this one. This is uh, why there's two of us. Yeah, yeah but sure, we yeah. have we have other topics that aren't yeah. astronomy. But we're going to go to asteroid tag, impact. Tag me in. Tag me in. Tag you. <laughs> okay, I'll start. I like this one. Um, uh, this is something that will happen eventually if we don't prevent it. Um, as as I like to say, you could ask a dinosaur, but you can't. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Um, so there are these asteroids out there and these, the, you know, we, okay, let me put it this way. There is debris hitting the earth all the time. About a hundred tons of material hits the earth every single day. Um, it's, that sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's actually enough to fill, I think, this room in about a month. Some, it's number something like that. I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But the point is, whenever you look up and see a shooting star, that is debris hitting us. It's a little tiny piece. But there are bigger pieces out there. And uh, some of them, you know, something the size of a beach ball or a sofa will burn up harmless in the atmosphere. But when you start to get to be about the size of this room or bigger, uh, it actually can blow up high in the Earth's atmosphere, create a, 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 a flash of heat and a shock wave that can start fires and knock down buildings. And by the time you get to something that's roughly 30 to 40 meters across, 50 meters across, uh, you're talking about 10 to 20 megaton yield explosion, something like the largest nuclear weapons we've ever blown up. And as they get bigger, you can do the math. So the point is we don't want these things to hit. So you have to, you have to know they're out there, which we do. We have to find them, which we're working on. We have to um, understand how to prevent them from hitting us, which is something we're also working on. And, and then we have to do it. And it's the doing it part. It's this part that we're having some trouble with. Um, it, it, it is possible. I won't go into details because there's not enough time. But there are a, a myriad of ways of getting these things out of the way. You can smack them with a space probe. You hit them, and that pushes them out of the way. You can um, uh, land a probe near it. Like, here's a probe, here's an asteroid, and then the gravity of the probe can actually tug the asteroid out of the way. Don't land it, put it near. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these things are spinning, they're tumbling, and so if you land on it, it's really hard. There are a lot of ways to do it. It's not hugely expensive. It'd probably be a um, billion dollars, something like that, less than the cost overruns on J James Webb Space Telescope. I'll put it that way. Um, uh, that's probably a, a bad analogy. But we, it, we, the point is we can do this if we have the will to do it. And the, I don't want to have to say, gee, I wish we had done that before that thing was in our sky. And, and the Dawn mission just totally proved we have the technology to do this. We went out. We, we caught up. This was the most awesome orbital insertion ever. The mission goes out, and it's creeping up, gets up on Vesta, and they're matched in their orbital speeds. And then they try trying to orbit something that has that little gravity is a bitch. So they sneak up on it and then try to orbit it. And they had the plan of, well, if we miss this time, we can just try in a few more days. So just the fact that you have to sneak up on it, match its speed, and then very carefully trying to get into orbit around it. We've proven we can do that. So we know we can get something near it and pull it gravitationally. Now, you see pictures of Behringer Crater, you hear death of the dinosaurs, but it's hard to really understand what asteroid impacts do until you really start studying craters. And I've been working on a project with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to look for all sorts of features in lunar images. And the image that brought it all home to me was one of boulders on the moon. To get a boulder on the moon, you throw a giant rock asteroid at the moon. It digs into the bedrock and hurls chunks of bedrock. So giant asteroid came in, threw a chunk of bedrock, hit. Later, another one comes along, repeats the process, throws a second boulder that lands, starts rolling down a hill, hits the first boulder, and split. The universe plays pool 
with boulders on the moon by hurling asteroids at its surface. Okay. We're ready for the next topic. Super volcano. Oh, we have some uh, life down at the other end of the table now. <laughs> uh, Super volcano is uh, not exactly a scientific term. <laughs> I, I believe the uh, term was coined by BBC when they uh, made the TV special Super Volcanoes. But uh, scientifically, uh, the I guess the scale or scale of destructiveness of volcanoes is uh, measured by the volcanic explosivity index, and if you want to insert the word super volcano into that index, um, you could start at the highest <laughs> rating, which is eight, which um, means a volcanic eruption would inject a thousand cubic kilometers of ash and material into the atmosphere. And the... They love it. Yay! They love it. <laughs> um, the greatest risk associated with that is something called volcanic, or volcanic winter, where basically ash in the atmosphere and also a certain amount of sulfur dioxide um, causes there to not be summer. And um, uh, this level of volcanic eruption has not happened in recent history. The most recent super volcano eruption was about 75 thousand years ago in uh, the Sumatra region and that caused a volcanic winter of about eight to ten years. Um, in recent history the largest volcanic eruption was a seven on the volcanic explosive index which means uh, more than a hundred cubic kilometers of ash released into the atmosphere, and that was um, in Indonesia in about 1815, and that caused a volcanic winter for one year in 1816. Um, about 12,000 humans were killed directly because of the eruption, and it's estimated between 70,000 and 90,000 people died as a result of crop failure and famine in the year after the eruption caused by the volcanic winter. And uh, is believed that um, the eruption about 75,000 75,000 years ago um, killed about 60% of the human population. Ooh. Ouch. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> More That's not promising. <laughs> the fact that there hasn't been a super volcano eruption in that many years. Um, can sort of lead to concern that there might be one <laughs> that could happen <laughs> in the near future, near future being within the next 10,000 years or so, so well, try, not to, yeah. right <laughs> try not to lose too much sleep at night. But. And I wouldn't exclude the fact that we're actually thinking about doing this naturally for global warming, put a bunch of sulfur dioxide in the air. Uh, and prevent global warming is warming. So that's so that may be into your super volcano scenario too. Yes, a super volcano would help prevent global warming. <laughs> there you go. It could be so we're part turning of off the, the sun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go to the next topic, uh, the Large Hadron Super Collider. <laughs> I know you want to hear about that. I've heard you talk about that. You okay. Well, it's either going to destroy the world or it's not, right? So that's a 50-50 shot. Shredding your cat. It's quantum mechanics. It may already have. Yeah. 
just haven't noticed. To be here or not to be here. <laughs> so there's actually one interpretation of quantum mechanics, the uh, Oxford multiverse interpretation that every time something could happen, both options occur elsewhere. So you're all dead somewhere else where the Large Hadron Collider went up and running on time, on schedule, yeah. with destruction involved. Uh, now, the, the reality is there's a bunch of us who are actually really rooting for the Large Hadron Collider to please create a microscopic black hole that will just evaporate very quickly so we can finally give Hawking his Nobel Prize. Because if that doesn't happen, you only get a Nobel when an experiment proves your results. So we need that black hole so this man can get his prize. And if it forms and refuses to evaporate politely as it should according to theory, and the universe has a habit of not doing what theory wants it to, then the little tiny black hole is going to happily fall to the center of mass of the planet Earth, where it will devour about one atom a year according to a set of calculations I read. Which means that you'll end up with a black hole that will be about four centimeters in size in the center of the Earth when the sun eats our planet. <laughs> I'm kind of good with that because then we at least know whether black holes evaporate or not. <laughs> it's science. But there was a science? science? There's also the quark nugget thing, the or Go the strange it. nugget. Yeah. Strange nugget that was the uh, so failed delicious. breakfast cereal idea from Kellogg's actually. <laughs> oh. um, oh so God. so they, they predicted all of these possible dangerous, deadly, horrible, awful particles. And that a bunch of perfectly normal ones that would allow us to understand particle physics. And one of the awesome things is in very recent results, they found none of the craziness. So the whole idea of supersymmetry, any of you who ever read anything that said that electrons and, and protons and all the normal particles have these supersymmetric, harder to spell and pronounce compatriots, those don't exist. And we know that as of this month. They need to get better error bars on the measurement, but it looks like from all of the reactions they've done so far, all of the measurements they have, we live in a non-supersymmetric universe. So what you're saying is, if instead Ozzy Osbourne was to sink to the center of the Earth, that would potentially cause more rock damage than a black hole. Right. Totally. Okay. I like science. Nice. <laughs> it has guitars and stuff. <laughs> but if he did, he'd bite the head off the core. Right. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be okay. The yeah, the the in the in the run up to the days when the when the collider was being turned on, there were these guys who were saying it was going to destroy the Earth. Um, one of these guys was kind of sort of a physicist, and the other one uh, wasn't even that. And they tried to sue. I was it in Arizona or Hawaii? I think in, Hawaii. in under yeah, and and it's like yeah, you understand Geneva. You know, not part of the United States. So have fun with that. Um, but they were saying it's, it was going to cause a black hole or this other thing, and I want to call it a strange nugget, which is a weird kind of matter that if it comes in contact with normal matter, we'll turn it into more strange matter. And so it's kind of like a, a virus, which can then spread and destroy the Earth. But none of this was true. There was a calculation that showed that perhaps the LHC could form one of these little tiny black holes. Um, but they went back later and redid the calculations and said, yeah, probably, probably not. And as Pamela said, even if they did create one, the thing that Hawking predicted is that if you make one of these little tiny subatomic black holes, it would immediately explode. So we wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't terribly concerned, and it, it seems that that's correct. And in three seconds left, I'll say you can go to hasthelhcdestroyedtheworld.com, I believe is the website, <laughs> and you can find out. If, if the website is up, we're okay? Yeah, pretty much? Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, good. Okay, our next topic is global pandemic. Ooh. And guess who's on now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got a different tag team. I love this one. Uh, so, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't joking when I introduced myself as the person responsible for keeping America safe from all public health threats, natural or man-made. That's my day job. That's what I really do. So basically you're saying, how could I get fired? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Trust me, can't how be done. I'm pretty, I'm pretty imaginative. You can't kill all humans on this planet uh, based on a bacterial, viral, or other microbial agent. However, I can kill lots of people. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's take this... We need no. to have coffee very <laughs> soon. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take this down two tracks, and so we'll put together, we'll put together a little blueprint for some nice carnage between us. So, let's get some audience participation here. West Nile virus, who's heard of that? All of you? Yeah. Let me roll you back to 1998. Not a single person in this room, unless you happen to be some geeky 
arthropod specialist would have heard of West Nile virus. What are the odds of that in this room? Yeah. <laughs> Any arbovirologist here? There you go. One. There you go. One arbovirologist. That would be one person who would raised their hand. Great example that we are not safe from emerging infectious diseases. Uh, right now we have dengue going on in Key West. Uh, Florida, haven't seen that in a hundred years, has actually happening day to day. Plague, people hear plague here, not from the United States, showed up in 1902 from China uh, and found a nice home in uh, uh, San Francisco in the Southwest. Let's see what else. HIV, anybody here heard of HIV AIDS? Yeah, exactly. All of you raising your hand, 1970, nobody would know what I was talking about. So here's your blueprint. You get a new bacterial agent, viral bacterial agent. It finds a nice reservoir or host wherever it goes, be it mosquitoes or people, uh, and it sort of takes hold and keeps on moving. So we're always at risk for that, and you can kill a lot of people that way. HIV AIDS, here in the U.S. alone, half a million deaths since we've had HIV here in the United States. And we remain at risk of that. SARS, any takers for SARS? That's a good, okay, great template for a new novel emerging pathogen out there living in the forest, having a great time. Somehow people, usually bat reservoirs, all of a sudden somebody comes in contact with it. You show up at a hospital and then we have this lovely thing called public health misadventure and boom. <laughs> You explode all over the world. Fortunately, we put that one back, uh, that genie back in the bottle, but it's still out there and we can get another SARS at any time. H1, and so influenza, lots of t takers on influenza. That one is 100% predictable. Don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. The last outbreak, fortunately, wasn't severe, but if you happen to be in 1918, 750,000 Americans died from H1N1, 1% of the U.S. population. It's the only time we had a decrease in our population in the history of actually the world, where we've gone down in population, 0.6% uh, in the U.S. alone that year. Usually we have 1.2 to uh, 1.2 plus growth every year. So you can actually see a downtick in the number of people who die. So that's one track on how you can kill a bunch of people. I'm actually going to jump in real quick because if I was going to handicap any one of those, I would actually put my bets on the flu. The interesting thing about SARS, as horrible as it was, was that it only had a 10% case fatality rate. The H5N1, which fortunately has not gotten from a good person-to-person -person transmission yet, actually still has a 60% case fatality rate. So if that changes enough to be able to be easily transmissible from humans, uh, between humans, that's probably of the ones that you've just been talking about, the one I So let me give you the most. second list. So that's natural. Man-made. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, people could sort of put Ebola with flu or something. Yeah, yeah, well, ain't going to happen. Uh, <laughs> but it makes for great books. <laughs> but... <laughs> However, what does happen is when we intervene in the natural course of events, that what gets us in trouble. Smallpox, right? We intervened in the natural course of events, killed 300 to 500 million people in the 20th century alone. Anybody in this room born after 1968 has not been vaccinated. That was a 40% case fatality, okay? So if somebody decided, you know what? I'm going to put smallpox back out there. We know it's a fit virus. You could kill a whole lot of people. All right, I'll stop. There. Okay. Yeah, and you just got cheers for that one, too. Yeah. Smallpox. Oh, That's and by the way, we're ready for that one, too. <laughs> one, one, one other thing. Keep in mind that 1918 flu outbreak is pre-highway system, pre-airline travel. It was, uh, we were very rural and it took a very long time to get from one place to another. And that's not the case anymore. So if we get something really juicy, it can move fast, fast, fast. Those of you with frequent flyer miles, die first. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to segue into the next one. This, it is Dragon Con. Zombie virus. <laughs> so take it away, panel. I'm betting Scott has something on this one. Well, you got to get fictitious for zombie virus. Cause <laughs> I'm still kind of mystified by the whole phenomenon that, you know, things that are actually dead somehow ambulate and move around and lately move around really fast, you know? <laughs> you got like the Carl Lewis zombies that are just <laughs> just booking along. Uh, I'll, I will concede this over to, um, to the biological people, but fictitiously, I think the best ground for that is getting into sort of a, a nanotechnology or some kind of mechanical 
organism, mechanical entity that uses, could use the human body's mechanics. So it could take you over since you already have muscles that move in a skeletal structure that supports you. That's a pretty good machine. If something could uh, come in and take that over and then use it for its own purposes, it would be sort of zombie-esque. You might work for a little while. I don't know. I really got nothing on zombies. Yeah, it's all right. It really depends on what the um, what virus or whatever infection, if we're going to go with that, is your, that you're basing it on. And the paper that I'm sure a lot of pe you heard about a couple of years ago, where they modeled the epidemiology of a zombie outbreak, is sort of based off of sort of the epidemiology of influenza. And you're looking again at some of these pandemic-based things about what is the mode of transmission of the virus, how easily transmissible is it? Is an airborne thing? Is it really just via bites? Um, and then the thing, of course, that, that become sort of the magic whenever you're looking at zombie movies is how long really from what the virus is going to do to the cells and the zombified people are they physically going to be able to structurally last before they start decomposing and so I think that's a rate limiting step that some people don't necessarily uh, consider as much we'll see what the other end of the table thinks and, though. you know there there's a lot of fiction that lately has gotten into different concepts of it okay well we know that the dead can't walk because biology doesn't work that way and physics don't work that way, but we can modify the rabies virus, we can get you know, the rage virus, we can start to get into things that destroy the concept of reasoning and, and rational thinking, and then that's something that's much more conceivable, I guess, that we could have a virus that spreads via contact that just gets rid of your ability to be civilized and makes you an animal that wants to go out and eat things. Uh, but you would eat all the parts. You would also eat toes as well as brains. Yeah. <laughs> the concept of eating brains, those are just uh, really, um, those are very finicky zombies. They know exactly, they, they, they're, they're gourmet, gourmet zombies, exactly. They know exactly what parts they want. They prepare it with a nice butter sauce, a little garlic, and everything works out okay. But some modification of, uh, of rabies or something along the line that changes personality, that realistically has the potential to spread. But the undead, not so much. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I believe the Center for Disease Control's website um, contains a zombie attack uh, preparedness yes, it does. guide. It's awesome. You've got it to go. It's uh, Okay, it's, apparently it's very useful. So. <laughs> well, it's... it's, it's it is simultaneously awesome and kind of lame because essentially they took their prepare for a natural disaster and then cut in zombies. So if you go to the website, it's actually on there and it talks about zombies, but then it's like, what do you need to do to prepare? Make sure you have your driver's license. Because that's what they cut over from the other disaster. It was like, no. Wear a I'm helmet. Sure. They, they, they had an enter into a find and replace. It was, right. yeah. I'm going to debate the lame part here. <laughs> How many people heard of it? Hello, so much for lame. Okay. <laughs> so, so the po and that's kind of, the, I guess, the cool part of my job. I can say I keep America safe from zombies also. Who gets to yeah. say that, right? Okay, Dude, that'll so, get you a lot of drinks bought in the bar right there. Yeah. There you go. Get a kit, make a plan, be prepared, check in on your neighbors. I mean, public health, preparedness, make sure you play your own personal role in preparedness, given the fact that pretty much the federal role is diminishing. Uh, with check in on cuts. your neighbors and shoot them in the head also. Check. Wear uh, your sneakers in case you have to run. And make sure you take care, yes. of your, take care of your neighbors. So zombies, two pieces. Oh, I got my seconds out. Okay, two pieces, magical, got nothing there. Uh, okay. Biologic. Yeah, potentially. I mean, there's. I can think of neurotoxins and other agents that could potentially get rid of sort of frontal core, uh, frontal functions, uh, lobe functions, and basically you're back to sort of scavenging, eating anything, not just people. You eat animals. People are easier to catch generally than animals. So I personally, if I was a zombie, would sort of go after people. Uh, and so that probably you could probably figure out some scenarios that would do it. Is it going to end the world? I don't think so. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Um, anybody that has a question, we'll need to need you to come up to the microphone. You'll need to come to the microphone. Make sure people in the back can hear you. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. The gamma ray burst. I have two questions on that. One, in the song, the chance of death is something like 125 million. Let me check my notes here. One in 14 million. One in 14 million. That would presume one in 14 million people on Earth have been killed by gamma ray bursts, or is that the chance of the Earth ending by gamma ray burst as one in 14 million? I was wondering if somebody <laughs> would ask about this. Calculating statistical lifetime odds of being killed by something is a little weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is say, 
Um, we know roughly how many stars are out there that can become gamma ray bursts, um, how close they have to be to the Earth to actually uh, hurt us, and then what are the odds that the, that beam I was talking about is actually pointed at us? Because if one goes off 5,000 light years away and the beam is pointed away from us, it doesn't matter. It's like shooting a gun near somebody, yeah. not at them. And when you calculate those overall odds, you say, well, in the next 70 years, which is sort of wrong because I'm 46, and by the time I'm 115, I don't give a crap about a gamma ray burst. <laughs> but, you know, in, in 70 years, what are the odds of the Earth being hit by a gamma ray burst? And it's one in 14 million. Um, the problem there is that it's, it'll, kill, it'll kill everybody. Okay. It'll kill half the people in the world instantly, and the other half over the next few hours or days. That brings up my second question. Okay. The gamma ray burst itself, by the time it strikes Earth, how wide a beam are we talking about? For instance, is the beam going to intersect the entire solar system? Is it going to strip the excess atmosphere off of Venus? Is it going to just... It's going to be light years in diameter. Yeah. Light so, years in diameter. Yeah, okay, if you're really you. close to it, it's, it's only a few hundred million miles wide. <laughs> but but you know when it's a, when it's a hundred light years away, it's like a light year or two or three or four light years wide. And, you, and you can dodge it. Yeah. So you can't. You know. So the yeah. tin the Stop tin foil holes. caps are not working yeah, for yeah. this one. What, one of the awesome things about this phenomena, and we actually see our sun doing this to Mercury, is that blast of light pressure is going to cause the atmosphere to streak out like a comet's tail from all the planets. Imagine Jupiter for a few brief bazillions of a period of time that I don't actually know. It's just short. Its atmosphere streams out like a comet tail. <laughs> okay. And we'll be dead. Next question. It's uh, a question for Mr. Khan. Um, I w want to know if you comment on parasites like toxoplasma that people don't really think about but are very widespread. And is that something I'll think about a lot or do anything about? Specifically toxo or? Or th something similar that's at pr just as prevalent? You know better than I do. So, <laughs> so, so are you asking about what can kill us or? Because in, not, so, not necessarily about the world ending. I just was interested okay. in terms of that's pandemics. A, so so that, that's, a, that's a great question. So let's remember that we're having a lot of fun here talking about the next pandemic. Infectious disease kills people worldwide every day. Over 2 million deaths if we think about respiratory illnesses, uh, HIV, AIDS, TB. And that's something we can make a difference about now, today, if you want to get involved. Uh, and, uh, and that's a whole slew of other diseases. We, you know, I love talking about pandemics. Pandemics, but every day public health is protecting you from flu borne, flu, uh, food outbreaks and all sorts of other things. And the same message is for you for around preparedness. Yeah, I can't really get you prepared for the solar burst, but if there's a hurricane or a tornado or next flu epidemic in your community, you can be prepared for that. So let's make sure we're prepared for those. And you can do that by participating in the vaccination clinic here at Dragon Con. Yeah. There you go. Okay. You have a question? Yes. Um, okay, well, first, you didn't actually address alien invasion. Just thought I'd <laughs> oh, say that. Sure. <laughs> Please, Absolutely. We're not allowed Absolutely. to talk or, about that right now. Or the robot apocalypse, for that matter. See, what we, we'd be glad to. We, Go we ahead. Just, Cylons. We, we don't know if the Cylons and the aliens come in peace or war. It's hard to calculate. <laughs> I will say, though, that one interesting thing on that is that when aliens show up, what are we going to do? Some people are going to want to have sex with them. <laughs> and Venusian herpes. <laughs> well, I actually want to use a real world analog of this. So Rule 34, actually... I think, is in effect yeah. here. <laughs> exactly. That happened. Um, but there's, there's a family of human herpes viruses, and of course, every different uh, the creature has different things like that. And for instance, there are monkey herpes viruses, one called herpes B, that if a human gets it, it switch, cheeses your brain and kills you. And so what I did my thesis on that. Yes. Yeah. What, what interesting <laughs> STDs could aliens possibly have? So, lovely, I, I want condom uh, public health message right here. <laughs> Even with aliens use oh, condoms. Oh, yeah. If you're going to get with the monkeys, then Rat that rascal, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's about the good of the people. But if they have spines, you have to be extra careful. Anyway. Oh. Yes. Okay, my actual question is for Taylor. Uh, a lot of these uh, catastrophes, like we can actually do something to prepare for them. What about super volcanoes? Is there anything we can do to sort of prep for that? Aside from umbrellas, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's probably about it. Um, as far as prediction, um, 
you can measure seismic activity around the volcano and see if it starts swelling or things like that. But as far as um, preparing, I would consult the Center for Disease Control's <laughs> website for a yeah, zombie attack. It seems like um, a place to go. Well, there's there's panicking, there's screaming. I mean, there's lots of stuff you can pray, do. Pray, pray, yeah. Pray, yeah. Pray, yeah. Pray, yeah. Pray, yeah. Hide. <laughs> Stop, my, pop, and roll. My, my personal kit doesn't last 10 years. Uh, yeah. I got you about 7 to 10 days, but after that, I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, buy a lot of canned foods. <laughs> um, <laughs> if <laughs> it d depends on the amount of ash and released into the atmosphere as to how long um, the sun's rays would be blocked out of the atmosphere of the Earth. Um, but we can't but actually do anything to the volcano, can we? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put, put a cork on the top, yeah. maybe? I don't know. Ice cream? Yeah. Ice cream. If we infect the volcano, yeah. yeah feed the volcano ice cream, keep it happy, keep it from crying. Yeah. It is a cone. <laughs> I was thinking if you drill down into it and release the pressure yeah. slowly, but then I realized, yeah, it probably won't work. In so, fact, that's basically lighting the fuse. Wouldn't it? I, Iceland's actually been doing some really neat research where recently they bored down until they hit magma and for Iceland knows what reason, injected water. <laughs> and this triggered a whole set of earthquakes that allowed them to understand when there is a gaseous burbling pressure in magma. So they now know what that looks like on a seismogram. And they're doing other research like this because on one hand it helps them figure out how to do geothermal energy more effectively. On the other hand, it's just cool you're playing with a volcano. <laughs> and eventually they may be able to figure out how to cause the volcanoes to go off as a slow leak rather than a catastrophic explosion. Because slow leaking volcanoes, we call that Hawaii. <laughs> and we like to go visit them. <laughs> okay, uh, next question here. I'm too short. Um, okay, uh, you were talking earlier about the asteroid um, ways of uh, preventing an asteroid from hitting the Earth. Uh, it's kind of been touched on already, but um, as far as the, the probe, you talked about a method of preventing that by using a probe to uh, its gra the probe's gravity pulling the asteroid away slowly. Um, you've now mentioned about like 10 years or something. Uh, two questions. Uh, first question is, how massive would a probe like that have to be, and then how would we have how would we get it up there? And then second question on that is, gravity is a two-way street. How do we prevent the probe? The probe is pulling on the rock, but how do we prevent the rock from just pulling the probe in and it's still coming at us? Right. Those, those are both really good questions. Um, in the first one, it, it's, um, it, 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 there's a lot of different scenarios, but imagine you see an asteroid coming at us. Typically, it's not that it's heading right at us. It's that it's going to pass us and go through a region of space where the Earth's orbit bends it just enough to bring it back. If that sounds familiar, that's what Apophis is going to do. This is a 250-meter-wide asteroid in April 2029. It's going to pass actually underneath our geosynchronous satellites. It's only going to be a few tens of thousands of miles above the Earth. And the Earth's going to, gravity is going to swing it around. And then seven years later on Friday the 13th, 2036, um, it will either miss us or not. Um, and to, we don't know because it has to pass through... Yeah, well, you know, there's a region of space it has to pass through, and if it passes right through that, the Earth's gravity is just enough to, to bend it to bring it back. So typically, if you, when you see one coming in, that's what's going to happen. You usually have a few years to know. If there's plenty of time, then you don't have to be, you don't have to finesse anything. You send up a rocket, boom, right? It's, it's like playing football. You have your linebacker. Do we have any experts on football on the panel? Um, who, who, who knocks, who knocks the, the, the offensive line out of the way so the quarterback is clear. So that's what you do. You hit it hard enough, you change its velocity, you change its direction, and it misses us. The problem is you might put it in another orbit that will hit us again 10 years later, 20 years later. That's why you want to use the finesse. So, you, that, so to answer the second part of your question, you bring in, oh, a minty of science. <laughs> I haven't used a minty of science in a long time. Thank you, Kylie. Um, so if you have an asteroid and you have your, your probe, it, it depends. I mean, if, if this thing is a mile wide, it's going to take a long, long, long time to pull it into a new orbit because it's very massive. If it's 100 meters across, it won't take as long because it's less mass, but it can still do a lot of damage. So you place your probe near it, and you have the rockets firing. I don't know if you can see this, but you have the rockets firing sort of not off to the side directly, not right at it, because if you go right at it, 
That's like Wiley e. Coyote trying to get his boat going by holding a fan. It doesn't work. Um, because the boat pulls on the fan, the fan pushes on the boat. So in this case, the gravity is pulling on the, on the, on the probe. And so you want to have the, the rockets going off to the side a little bit, but still heading off in this direction. They miss the asteroid, and then you just give it just enough thrust so that you're just barely moving this guy a little tiny bit, and it will drag the asteroid along with it. The asteroid's still pulling on it, but you balance that and then add a little tiny bit of thrust. And that's what you use an ion drive for, and that's we've used ion drives very successfully. Extremely low thrust rockets that you can burn for months and years. It's the perfect technology for this, and we've shown that it works. So we can do this. It's just a matter of, of having, like I said, the will to do it. I always oh. knew Starbucks would destroy the world. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all, all the time for questions that we have. But the uh, other people, if you're... Excuse me. If we did these, start 10 minutes late. If, the, if these folks don't, uh, are, don't have anywhere else to, to go, immediately you might be able to catch them before they go to their next panel. Right. But thank you very much for coming to this uh, crossover track. We so much enjoyed you having, having you here. Thanks, everyone.